Good morning, Bethlehem Covenant Church. Thanks for joining us here on this first Sunday in December, December 3rd, and it is the first Sunday in Advent. Our church is decorated uh, for, for the Christmas season. We have the Advent candles out, and in fact, today we light We light the first candle of the Advent season, which is the hope candle. He remembers that light has come into the darkness in Christ and that all of our despair, all of our hopelessness is gone. Nothing is impossible with God. God loves us. He has given to us the gift of his son and that in him, we now can have joy and eternal life and forgiveness of sins and peace and his spirit to live with inside of us every day. And, uh, and that is this greatest joy. And sometimes we take it for granted, the gift of Christ and how God is with us each day. Um, and, and so we, we wanna pause this month and really remember him. One of the ways we try to remember him every, every day is we have these Advent devotional books. Uh, there's 25 different writings, one for each day leading up to Christmas. They were prepared and written by different members of our church. Uh, each one uh, a different person and they're on a scripture and they're a great way to keep Christ at the center each day during this season and the busyness of it. And so we have these books available at the church. You can pick up a practice, uh, just a paper copy one, or if you're on our Facebook page, we have them every day. We have the different reflection posted there on our Facebook page and you can uh, be a part of that and read them there. Um, we also have a couple giving projects that are going on right now. We have, we're filling stockings uh, for the residents of Waverly Care Center, and we're gonna hand them out on uh, the 13th over there with uh, caroling. We're gonna carol for them and then hand them a stocking, and it's always an annual tradition of ours, and, and it's a good one if you wanna fill a stocking. We have some here you can take, and we have a giving tree as well with different gifts for different kids. Um, in the Lincoln and surrounding area that are in need. And you can purchase a gift for that kid and bring it to the church and then we give it on uh, to those families. And that's another way you can give uh, this Christmas season. Um, we invite you, uh, we have our church services here, 830, 1030. Um, and then on the 17th though, is our kids Christmas program. It'll be only a 1030 service and the kids are gonna be performing for us. And then on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, we have just gonna have our 1030 service in the morning. And then we will have a 7 p.m. candlelight service in the evening, if you would like to join us for that, to again, celebrate the birth of our Savior. Uh, this morning, I uh, will begin our uh, Advent season with a looking of Luke 1, verses 5 to 23. Thanks for joining in. Okay, if you have your Bibles, I'd have you turn over to Luke chapter 1 as we look at verses 5 through 23 today on this first uh, week of Advent and we begin into the Christmas story and digging deeper into all that it says. The first scripture for, for the season that I want us to look at is Luke 1 verses 5 to 23 and it says this, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing the Lord's commands and decrees. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. 
And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right hand of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he is never to take wine or fermented drink, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their kids and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. So now you'll be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he couldn't speak. They realized he had seen a vision, for he had kept making signs to them, but was remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. One thing that I always feel at Christmas, ever since I was little, uh, is just how near the Lord really is. Not just because of the warm sentiments and good feelings and, you know, that the holidays often bring. Not just because of all my many good memories that I have of Christmas has gone by or decorating the tree or the movies that we watch, the music we listen to and the showing love to others and giving. And I'm into all of that. But that's not what I mean. That's not the feeling I'm talking about. I think for me, the reason Christmas time always feels special and, and like the Lord is just a little bit closer is because this is exactly what this season reminds us of, that he is near, that he came to be near. In every Advent devotion we read, in, in every song we sing, in every scripture we remember that in Christ, God came to dwell among us, to be where we are. He is Emmanuel, which means God with us, not God far away, not God out of touch or hidden, but with you today in your struggles, available to you if you would only call on his name. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Christmas is not just the birth of some guy long ago. It is the coming of our Lord and God. It is the light of all light entering into darkness. It is Almighty God come down to be right where you are today and tomorrow, to be near you. He left the glories of heaven and came to earth that we might know him, that we might open our heart to him and be loved and to love him, to serve and to let him help us in our sin and trials and temptations, to no longer hide from God but run to him for he has come for us. Christmas is about God drawing near. I think another reason this season just makes me feel like the Lord is close is, is that every scripture we read, including the one for today, it mentions angels and it mentions miracles and God working out his eternal plan just behind the scenes, you know, Behind the curtain in heaven, right beyond our sight, God is there working out something 
you up to something day after day month after more month you know in the grind of life we can f- lose sight of this we can focus and think what's so important are the the daily tasks and their urgent deadlines and and in our troubles we can forget god we can forget that we live in his world and that he is king of all kings and he is lord of all lords and and he holds the whole world including our life in his hands and that everything that happens is not just about us and it's it's not just up to us to solve or to figure out but but he is the savior of the world he is the hero in the story not us it's him and every day our life You know, God is up to something. Our Father, our Savior, our Shepherd, every day is working. And He shows up in in different ways. And if we're paying attention, we will see Him. And often it is at times when we don't expect Him. That's when He's knocking on our door. That's when He's showing up as we go about our business. And looking back, we can see the hand of God. In the Christmas story, this is the case, repeated time after time. For Zechariah, who goes to the temple to pray, he didn't expect to meet an angel that day, but he did. Just like Mary, when she goes and draws water from the well in Nazareth, like any other time, she didn't expect that day to encounter an angel and find out that she was the one chosen to be the mother of our Lord. Or Joseph, as he, as he went to bed and he had dreams, <laughs> he didn't expect that night to have a dream, of a vision of an angel telling him not to be afraid to take Mary home as his wife, for the child in her is the Son of God. The shepherds watching over their flocks that night in Bethlehem, they had no idea that that particular evening, their eyes would see what they had never seen before. Thousands of angels would light up the sky before them, telling them a child had been born for them. Or the wise men, who were students and scholars, looking in books for answers, all of a sudden they saw something, a star that pointed to a king, and it was beyond their understanding. But in faith they chose to go on this long journey And follow that star wherever it would lead. And it led them straight to Jesus. In every Christmas story we read, we encounter person after person, surprised by God, interrupted by God, going about their daily life and God just appears. And he reveals himself just a little bit more of who he is and what he's going to do and and how they get to be a part of it and and, and so I think this is a season where we're enco- encouraged to see that God is closer than we think. And nothing is impossible for him. And every day that we seek him out, we get to know him more. I love the angel's words to Zechariah in our scripture. When Zechariah the priest says, how can me and my wife have a child? I am old and my wife is well beyond childbearing years. For starters, I love that Zechariah said that he was old and his wife was beyond childbearing years. I mean, he is a very smart and wise husband there. Um, He doesn't say that she is old. He says he's old. She's beyond childbearing years. He's a wise man. But I love that he tells the angels, angel this, you know, if that somehow matters, you know, that, well, wait a minute, yeah, you are old. That's not going to be able to happen. No, the angel says in verse 19, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Basically, he said back to Zechariah, are you kidding me? Do you think your age is any limitation to what God is able to do? And aren't you a priest? Haven't you read the Bible? Don't you know the story of Abraham and Sarah at a hundred years old? I mean, don't you see what God can do? And I could just imagine Zechariah and his thinking, yeah, but that's Abraham. That's not me. We all think like Zechariah, and we need to stop it. We all tend to think of the people in the Bible as different 
than us, a different time, a different person, that that was Moses or that was Abraham or that was Peter or that was Mary and we're just Dan, you know, or we're just whomever. <laughs> um, that happened long ago. We're living now in our time. We have to reject this thinking. For every person of the Bible was just like us, going through their ordinary days when God came to them and spoke and told them what he was going to do and how they're going to be a part of it. And their world and ours would forever be changed. I tell you, if I could encourage you with one thing this particular Christmas season, it would be look for God. Seek him out. Call on his name because he is closer than you think. Take a moment each morning and in the quiet stillness, just look up. Pause in the middle of the busy or as you're walking in the midst of a crazy store with the crowds all around you. Just stop in the aisle for 20 seconds and look around. Just take a moment. You might think I'm crazy saying this, but you will begin to see the Lord. As you take a minute to visit with your mother or in the lonely prayers you, you pray at night, you know, take a minute and just see how close the Lord is and how much he's wanting to bring you comfort in that moment or meet you in that moment. As you read your Bible or as you sing a worship song at church, as you help a person in need, just stop and look a little closer in that moment. Seek the Lord and you will find the Lord. Call on his name. He is near. It's what this whole season reminds us that he came to do. Now, I want to take a closer look at our scripture for today. There's a lot that's important in these verses. For long before Jesus was born, God gave his people a promise. He spoke it through the prophets, telling them that one day he was going to send a savior. The Hebrew word for that is Messiah. The Greek word for Messiah is Christ. Call, you know, it, is, it means anointed one, chosen one, savior. For the people of Israel, they had been through a lot of stuff. They had turned away from God and it had opened the door for many enemy nations to come on in and take them over. And they had lived in oppression for about 700 years. Someone had ruled over them and they were not their own. They were not in peace for about 700 years. The first nation that took them over way back was Babylon. Babylon came into their land and destroyed it and took them into exile. Then Persia, then Greece. And at the time of Jesus' birth, it was Rome. But through it all, the people of God held on to a promise, a hope that one day God would raise up a king, a Messiah, who would bring peace and restore them like in the days of David. The prophet Isaiah in 700 BC wrote the words of Isaiah 714, which says that the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. The virgin birth was prophesied 700 years before. In Isaiah 9, it says, For the people walking in darkness will see a great light. For to us a child will be born, to us a son will be given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Child, a son, foretold. Well, in Malachi 3.1, the final prophet of the Old Testament, it says that before the Savior is to come, God will do something. He will send a messenger who will prepare the way for him. In Malachi 4.5, it says, this man will come like the prophet of Elijah. Now, it's interesting that the Jews back then interpreted this prophecy that Elijah himself would appear in person. But it wasn't going to be Elijah come back from the dead. But as we read here in our scripture for today, it was going to be somebody who would be like Elijah, who would speak like he did in the spirit and power of Elijah, God's power, to bring the people back to God, to turn their hearts towards the Lord, to call them to repent. 
the prophets foretold that there would be a person who would come before Jesus, a person who would prepare the way for the Lord. And so what we are reading in Luke 1 is exactly that, that this person, the angel is saying, is going to be John, John the Baptist. And we read in our scripture for today how the angel came to tell the father that him and his wife were going to be, his wife was going to be pregnant and that they would have a special child from birth. That child would be filled with the Holy Spirit with this divine purpose. Now this reminds me of the words of Jeremiah 1.4 where it says that the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. In our scripture, the angel is telling Zechariah the same thing, that their child had a God-given purpose to be the one foretold to prepare the people to meet Jesus. Now, I just want to pause for a moment here to mention one extra thing that I see happening here. God is accomplishing two things at the same time. He is putting into motion his grand eternal plan, but he is also doing something else, something very personal and beautiful here. He is giving this older couple who wanted a child and prayed for one. God chose them to be the one to have John. He is answering their prayer for a kid. He is blessing them with a son. And that just really warms my heart. That speaks to me about the goodness of God. Because God does these great, big, grand things. But he also shows us these personal things. These very intimate, he knows us, he hears our prayers, he loves us personally kind of things as well. For the Bible says that God knows the desire of our heart. And the angel here tells Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife will bear you a son. Your prayer has been heard. And I know that we don't always get everything that we want. Sometimes we wait for things that we pray for. Sometime God answers in better ways that we didn't even know. Sometimes we ask for things that aren't his will and one day in heaven we'll see why. But I think this scripture reminds us that God is good. He loves us. He knows us personally. He hears our prayers. And he's not just too busy carrying out the grand plan, eternal purpose in, in a formal and stoic way. No, he loves us, has compassion. As we read here, he personally chose this couple to bless them with a child because he knew they had been hoping and praying for one. I think of the story of, of Hannah in the Old Testament and how long she prayed for a child. And God in his mercy gave her Samuel. And she gave Samuel back to the Lord for his purposes. And Samuel went on to serve the Lord as a priest and a prophet. But before Samuel blessed the world, God blessed Hannah. He knows us. And so he accomplishes two things at one time. And maybe you can even see the very personal and intimate ways that God has answered your prayers and has known you and what you needed and wanted and has blessed you. As I read this, you know, I wonder how long Zechariah and Elizabeth maybe prayed for that child. It might have been a long time. Maybe even gave up hope in having one. But the angel said in verse 20, this child would be a poor born at the appointed time. So we pray in our time, but God answers in his. You know, I just want to personally say that I believe that God put me in the family that I was born into, to the parents I was meant to have. Boy, they've been a blessing to my life. I hope I've been a, a blessing to theirs. But he gave me in my life the experiences that I needed. He, he's never taken his eyes off of me. Just like in Psalm 121, it says that the Lord watches over us, our coming and our going, both now and forevermore. And, and I believe that he does that in each of our lives. I believe that he created me for certain things and you for certain things. And 
whether we always feel we had good parents or lousy ones, good experiences or difficult ones, he's over all of them. And he has allowed them for a reason. We have been born with a purpose, just like John. And it is to bring glory to God and live for him and love him. And to fulfill the things that he created for us to do. And so we don't have to compare ourselves to other people and their experiences or their life. And, or covet what they have or don't have. We just need to look and trust God with what he has given to us and be faithful to the purposes that we have been created. For we all, not just John, but all of us have been created by God to worship and live for him. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, all things were created by him and for him. That means us. We find our true identity and purpose in Christ. We've all been born with a purpose, just as John and Zechariah and Elizabeth, just as the wise men and the shepherds and Mary and Joseph. We were each made by God and for a purpose, his. And when we truly give our life to Christ, we find our true life. Something else, though, I wanted to point out from our scripture is that the angel tells Zechariah what John's specific assignment is going to be. He says in verse 14 to 17 that first John is going to be a joy and a delight to his parents. And I don't want us to skip over that. <laughs> I think that is really special. I love that the angel mentions that, that this child is going to first bring joy to his parents. God wanted to bless them with a family, and this child was going to be a joy for them to raise. And again, if I may, being the father being a dad to Aria and Matthew has been such a joy and a delight in my life, and I know to Carrie's. We, we put so much pressure on kids today and parents, and sometimes we can miss just the joy of being able to have a family, to be a family. It's been one of the greatest joys of my life to be their dad, to watch them grow up, to help them with things, to love and be loved by them. For all the worrying we do and all the little fusses that also happen and fights and hurts and being a part of their life has been such a joy. The four of us were able to travel to, to Chicago, or to, sorry, to Colorado for Thanksgiving this past week and, and to see my parents and to be able to be together for that holiday. And and it's, it's often the little things that we take for granted that, that we look back on are really the, the most joyful things, you know. It's being in the conversation in the car along the way. It's the jokes that we all internally get because we've grown up and been together for so long. It's the stop at the gas station when we all run in and grab something and come back. It's, it's the hug before bedtime. It's the, a time of prayer around the table. It's... It's the games that we play. It's, and all the cares and the worries of life. Don't miss the purposes of God, which are just the joys that he brings, the family. I didn't want us to overlook the first thing that the angel says to Zechariah that John was going to be. He was going to be a joy to his parents. But the second thing that the angel says here is that John was going to bring joy and rejoicing to many. His ministry would cause people to rejoice in the Lord. When, when John began his ministry, he told the crowds that gathered around the Jordan River that the one who was coming right after him, whose sandals he was unworthy to untie, was going to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world and would baptize them not just with water, but with the Holy Spirit. John, like the prophets who had come before him, brought hope to a people when they desperately needed it. That God had not forgotten his promises or forsaken them in their sin, but that soon and very soon he was coming for them. And I think about the word Advent, what it means this season. It means that we wait, but with expectation. It's that we hope, but we know it's coming. It, it's like after a long, dark night, on the horizon, we can make out just the slightest ray 
of the sun beginning to appear, and we know it's almost day. You can see it's beginning. It's the advent of a new day. It may still be mostly dark, but the morning is almost here. The sun is about to rise. This darkness is coming to an end, and it's not going to be here much longer. There's hope. It's the advent of a new day. The kingdom of God is near. John preached that. He embodied that. He was the one who was to come first to prepare for a world to meet Jesus. His presence was a sign that it was almost here. Which leads me to the third thing I wanted to point out that John, it says here, was going to do. He would lead the people to return to God. He would baptize them in the Jordan River because this was the great location of the great miracle in their history. In their past, when God gave them this promised land, they entered it through the Jordan, by crossing the Jordan. God parted those very same waters so that his people could enter. They entered through the Jordan. And before they crossed that Jordan, they had to consecrate themselves before God parted the way for them. They had to set themselves apart for him promising their faith in God that they would be his people and follow and obey his commands and not before bow before other gods. So what John would do in his ministry when he was older is he would invite people out to the very same Jordan River to remind them of who they are and where it all began, to show them the condition of their hearts and how far they'd fallen away from that one day long ago how they had forgotten their first love, God, how they needed to repent of their sins and turn back to God as number one and consecrate themselves again, for the Lord himself was coming. Now it tells us in Luke chapter 3, this message was actually well received. Large groups of people went out to John at the Jordan River and were baptized. A revival was happening in the land before Christ began to preach. Lots of people were coming back to God opening up their hearts to him. And John didn't hold back in his preaching. In fact, he preached his strongest message to the religious leaders because they didn't think they needed saving. You know, they thought their ancestor Abraham, you know, their, you know, sense that they were Jews, that they were in the clear, they, they, that they didn't think that they were sinners because outwardly they were religious and going through all of these rituals and, but they failed to see deep inside their heart had turned away from God long before and that they were doing their own things and that they had pride and hypocrisy. So that is why John would preach his toughest messages to the religious people because deep inside he loved them and he wanted to help them. But if they couldn't see the truth and the condition of their heart and then their need for a savior, they would reject Jesus when he came. And in fact, that's what they did. They refused to see their own sin, and so they rejected Jesus. But this needs to be a reminder for all of us that there's no new life without first repentance. We all got to come to the Jordan River first. We all have to be broken over our life and repent of our sins and see our need for God and his son who came for us. If we don't see the need, Christmas will just be the secular holiday that never touches our hearts like it should because we never truly received the gift of Christmas, which is Christ. He is the gift, the one that our heart has really been searching for, the Savior of our sin. So before Jesus came, John called people to repent. And so too it is with us. Before we can truly receive Christ, we have to first recognize our need for him, that our way isn't working. We have to see our own sadness, our own sin, our life choices taking us down the wrong path, and that the answer is not found in the world or us just trying harder, but the answer is in the greatest gift that's been ever given, that we celebrate at Christmas time, the baby born in the manger who would one day take up a cross. He alone has the power to save us. The final thing I want to mention about this scripture today is that John, you know, when he grew up, he knew who he was and he knew his place. He knew his purpose. Just like Mary, who called herself just the servant of the Lord, so too John never exalted himself as more. He just exalted Jesus. John never tried to be the Messiah, just the one who pointed people to him. Even when crowds began to 
think he was the Messiah, John would quickly correct them, saying he was only there to prepare them to meet the real one. In John 3.26, after Jesus starts to go around preaching and healing, all the crowds start leaving John and going towards Jesus. And, and John's disciples, they come to him and say, hey, everybody's leaving us and going after him. And, but this doesn't upset John. This is why he came, not to gain crowds for himself, but followers of Christ. John replies in John 3.27, a man can only receive what is given to him from above. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Christ, but am sent only ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends to the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is now mine. He must become greater, and I must become less. For the one who is from above is above all. Above all, even me. Is Christ bigger in your life than you are? Is Christ bigger than all of your plans? Bigger than your ego? Bigger than what you want? <laughs> do you love the crowd and the likes and the glory? Or do you live for him? John didn't seek his own glory or legacy, but Jesus's. His life was not to build himself up, but to build up Jesus. His joy was not in his own circumstance or people following after him, but his joy was when others came to Christ. John knew who he was, just the opening act. Jesus was above all, the center stage. He knew his place and what his life was about, and it didn't shake him when everyone left to follow the Lord, for that is why he came. And so now was the time for Jesus to become greater and him to become less. And I thought to myself, shouldn't there be something of this attitude in me and all of us? For our life is not about us. It's about him. We were created by him and for him. It's not about our glory, but his. And our joy is found in him. This Christmas season, maybe we all need to humble ourselves to prepare our hearts again, to repent of our sins, to be still and know God and, and see him in the ordinariness of every day, to hear his voice because he is near, and to be ready to receive him completely. For the real gift of Christmas is Christ. He was born for you and me. Are we open to receiving Christ this Christmas? Have a wonderful Sunday. Thanks for watching this week's sermon. We hope you can join us in worship again soon. To stay up to date with all of Bethlehem Covenant Church news and events, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out bccwaverly.org.